people want to be moved to tears. People want to feel a mystery that can't be put into words. They want to feel inspired. They want to feel hopeful. And that's what we have been taught to create with Indian classical dance and what I hope to transmit through my performances. Who is this woman living in Rajasthan, India? Dancing Odissi classical dance, dancing with Kaubalya gypsies in the desert, and traveling the world performing contemporary fusion dance. How does a Western woman embrace a different culture and make it her own, you know, over 13 years? I came to India for Odissi, but it was also in my mind to take a trip to Rajasthan and find a tribe of gypsies that I had seen in a beautiful film called Lacho Drum. And I came to Rajasthan to find this tribe of Kalbelia. And I found the Kalbelia here in Pushkar. When I met the Kabelia, they were not teaching their dance to others. They learn by watching their older sisters, their aunties, their mothers. It's not a dance form that was taught, and they had no idea of how to break it down. It took a long time even for them to understand how would you convey this dance movement to someone from outside of our tribe. And really the way that I learned their dance was spending years and years in the gypsy camp, eating with them, playing with the children, learning their songs, and just being a part of their culture and understanding what are their values and what do they consider beautiful. What is the Kalbelia sense of humor? And what is an artist in the Kalbelia world? There is an aspect of charm in their dance that is what makes it so fun to do. It's a completely improvisational dance. This is my teacher of belly dance, Odissi, sometimes Kalbelia also. I know her when I'm kids. When I'm small, around 14, 13, I know her. She's like my sister. I use Rajasthani dance to tell my story because I've been living there for, it's now over 13 years, and I really feel at home there. It's just a pure expression of joy for me. I also work with another cast of artists from Rajasthan, very traditional people that are called Langa and also Manganir. They memorize these stories, they memorize songs, these rags, and they pass it down generation to generation. They are the ones who used to perform for the Maharajas in Rajasthan. When I dance with langa, when I dance with this traditional music, I feel that history. It's a sense that you get being with people who have held their tradition intact, that they live as they lived 800 years ago. They keep those traditions alive, and there's meaning to the music, there's meaning to their way of life. <laughs> 
These people who are villagers, who are nomads, these traditional people who I'm associated with in Rajasthan teach me what it is to be detached and living in the present moment, not worrying about fame and fortune, not worrying about where I stand in society, not worrying about tomorrow is really how these people live. Jai Durga As a dancer, I have many faces within the dance. I'm a performer, and I'm a student, and I'm a teacher. I feel much more like a student than a teacher because when you study under great masters, you just can't imagine that ever one day in your life you will measure up to their greatness. I really focus myself more as a student. I want to embody the art at such a height. Temple dancing was a tradition that in recent history was centered in certain very famous temples throughout India and one of those famous temples was the Jagannath temple in Puri. And so women called Maharis would dance in the Jagannath temple and Jagannath is a form of Vishnu who is also Krishna. And so this Vaishnav temple, this temple of Jagannath, these dancers were dancing and acting out the stories of Lord Krishna. And the mood and the bhava of Lord Krishna is very sweet and romantic and it's like associated with springtime and just loveliness. So this feeling in the dance form, this uh, little bit of sensuality that's there is not an earthly sensuality, it's a divine kind of romantic mood relating to the Lord as your beloved. And finally, the tradition died out. So uh, temple dancing at one point in India in 1935, it was outlawed. Women were outlawed from dancing inside of temples. And slowly, the dance was revived in, and classicalized into what we call Odissi. Before, it was just what was done in the Jagannath temple. And then when it was classicalized, there were gurus who were male gurus and actors from the theater and scholars who got together and read the old texts on dance, studied the sculpture in all the temples in Orissa, and then classicalized this dance form, made it even more highly structured, and um, the training process was established, how one would go through the training, and then it was a, a dance form that was um, put on the stage. And this was at a time when India became independent, and classicalization of many indigenous dance forms were underway, which is, you know, the masters tried as much as they could to retain the ritualistic practices and the spiritual intention in the dance form. Really can't explain why I was so sure when I took that leap of faith to come to India to study Odissi and the chance to meet the masters that I have had, my Kathak guru, my Odissi gurus, my spiritual guru, it's pure luck to meet a master of such immensity. I met Sujata Appa just in the last few years. I had another guru to start Odissi and I don't think I would have been ready if I met her from the first day because she's full power. It, it takes a very ready and willing student to already be surrendered completely to work at the level that she demands. Kalina is a very good human being, first of all I should say that. And such a devotee. The first day when I see her, I could feel the devotion in her eyes, in her heart. 
and by staying with her, spending some time with her, with close circuit, I could feel she has that Guru Bhakti, you know, to devotion to her Guru. And I could clearly understand because it relates to me also, because I also a devotee of my Guru. So it is a connection when one of my students she starts loving me or he starts loving me, I could clearly understand the point of view, which angle the devotion comes to me. So Colina is definitely one of them to whom I understood that she loves her Guru, she loves the art and she wants to be into inside that, the involvement, the deep sense of getting the art and to nurture whatever possibility from the art. The thing about studying under a guru and that tradition in India, which we call the Guru Shisha Parampara, that lineage is not just about learning dance technique, it's about learning the way of life, the path of the artist, and the way to fulfillment, ultimate fulfillment, because in India, we believe that art is a path to realization. She is someone who is very devotional, and I learn what it is to be a devotee from her. I learn the deeper meaning, the deeper nuance of the stories we tell in our dance. Our dance is rooted in Vedic philosophy. The stories from the Puranas about the gods and the goddesses are what we use as content in the dramas that we portray. We have to understand that, connect with it, and we have to believe in it. So she not only teaches me the steps, the mudras, and the stories that we're acting out, but she really lives by those values that we convey through our stories. And I have rarely met another classical Indian dance guru that I can say really lives by that, for that code of ethics, that code of values that we learn about through the Vedic stories. That beauty inside of the dance is not to be confused with a beauty that is an external beauty. So what Indian classical art teaches us is satyam shivam sundaram. But what is the binding element of beauty is, is an eternal truth. What is eternal truth? It's spirit. Standing on stage is a very vulnerable thing. It's thrilling in that way. The audience gets to participate in your vulnerability to strip things down to their essence and try to reveal a truth. I know that if my mind is clouded with insecurities or doubts or fears or any concern or even pride, that that will cloud the experience for the audience, that they won't get that divine transmission of beauty, of peace and contentment because I'm busy worrying about my own experience and really performing in front of an audience it's a shared experience. It's just as much mine as it is the audience's. I have dedicated my life over a decade to collecting this wisdom, this, these precious teachings. It just feels natural the next step would be to share that. My school in Rajasthan is in a temple 
And I don't think I would still be doing Odyssey if I didn't have a school that was inside of a temple. It brings context to the dance, why it's a devotional dance form, and why we're dancing and acting out stories of the gods and goddesses. It all finds a context and makes sense in that temple atmosphere. So life in a temple, it's not a fantasy, it's a reality which takes a lot of discipline and it takes a lot of sacrifice. One of the special things about the school is that it's not just the dance or it's not just yoga. She is working to have us um, understand the hidden layers in all of this. And she explained a concept called Guru Shakti where when you see a dancer dancing and their technique is beautiful and perfect, but there's something that's not necessarily, like, just there's no spark versus a dancer where Yes, their technique is perfect, but there's something extra, maybe in the way that they move their eyes or just in their, their energy that makes you have this emotional reaction to them. And that is um, connected to the guru's sort of, the ancestral blessings and the ancestral energy flowing through them when they dance. And that's what, I, what I've seen when I see Kalina dance and when she's sharing her practice and her sort of gems of wisdom with us. And that's why she has this community of women who are coming to her to learn more than just the physical practice of dance and yoga. Something different that I get from studying with Colina is that she really sees dance as a very holistic pra practice and she incorporates, she, she truly sees it as a yoga. It's not just a dance form, it's a very full experience and she really transmits this to us in every moment, every day, the evening classes where we sit down and talk about various philosophies and theories. This is the perfect place in the Temple Dance Festival and the Shakti School of Dance. It's like living it. It's like a living workshop where you're living, you know, getting to that place where you're offering. Offering your efforts, offering your dance, offering your love, offering yourself so that something hopefully divine and greater can flow through. What you see is the most important art in my life. Although I do other art forms like fusion dance and Rajasani folk dance, no other art that I've come across offers that potential of expressing your higher self. Because we do Odissi to become a conduit for something divine. I have my cultural roots, my familial roots, but spiritual roots, even you know, metaphysical wisdom of ancient times all over in indigenous cultures are being lost slowly. Um, and we're focusing on other things in our society. In this school and in our philosophy classes, or even just in the art itself, in the stories we're portraying, we are keeping alive these ancient virtues and wisdom that leads to a place of liberation. And philosophy also comes with the simple reason that I'm asking who am I? I'm doing a work on Upanishads. And even in those times, that is, we're talking of BCs, they're talking of uh, these rishis, these munis going to the forest, Aranyas, and asking the question about who am I, what is my existence, and what is my connection to the world that I perceive. And even this modern world, you're asking the same question. And I think arts do answer these questions. At least they get you closer to it. <laughs> From years of training in Indian classical dance, I bring these techniques and aesthetics together with contemporary dance and belly dance. Well, 
I travel the world teaching Indian fusion, Indian fusion belly dance. I teach these styles of dance and I perform them and they're really, the style of dance is, uh, it's my own creation. It's where I'm able to play with the classical Indian aesthetics and the values of Indian art and carry them over to something modern that is something maybe outside of Indian culture but is my own experience, my life experience, my dance experience. All of my students who've come to any of my workshops, I just feel so proud of them. I respect them so much because usually people come to my school or come to my retreat to have a paradigm shift, to have a moment in their life where they step outside of the mundane and step outside of just going through the motions and they want to challenge themselves and they want to grow and they want to explore their potential and I really try to push everyone to their limits in my class and when I see people rising to the occasion I just feel really in awe of that they're my heroes I want to be like that I want to push my limit every day and every dance class and when I see my students doing that, I feel like it's this um, bouncing back and forth of inspiration that they inspire me. And their sincerity, you know, the students who come with really sincere intentions and just to enjoy every moment in the class. And I see that on their face. It's like, oh my God, I just, I have so much to learn from them in their contentment, in, in going through that struggle of learning a new dance. And I love to be a part of that. It's very inspiring. A real incredible teacher who um, offers such simplicity and such elegance and such beauty. Like those three words just keep coming through even though the dance is so complex. Watching Kalina dance and the devotion that you see when she's doing it, it's, and you, you don't just see it, you feel it, you know, like, and it's this feeling of like, God, I want to be a conduit of that, of, of grace, of this human and not human feeling. It's very rare to find a performing artist in the dance field who constantly challenges herself and uh, who lives big. Uh, Colleen is such an inspiration. That's what so much of this is. We will act as conduits between the past and the future. And we're in a position where we can take this information and make daily choices of how are we going to perpetuate this knowledge, this beauty, this tradition, and make it relevant while not diluting it for personal purposes, if that makes sense. There is a much higher calling here. I find so much power and so much beauty and so much inspiration from my lineage. I feel like more than being a dance teacher, I just want to teach people about the power of lineage, that adhering to a lineage is not limiting, that it's limitless once you're inside of the technique and the form, but that's where you get a hidden power and a hidden confidence that it's not me who stands on stage, it's me and my whole lineage standing right behind me backing me up and giving me energy and giving me inspiration and reminding me that what I'm doing is right, I wouldn't trade that for a watered down version. And I feel Colina is that kind of devotism. I might just be born an Indian, I understand the language, I'm blessed to be here because I love India in its own sense. But there are people whom I admire and I think she should be one. As individuals, as real devotees. Art is something which transmits, transforms, and transcends. And if it doesn't do those things, then it's not considered art in our Indian tradition. 
to transmit a positive message that transforms people for the better and will help them transcend the mundane, then this is what art is. This is our goal of art. Come on, come on, come on.